out here is number 97, Tommy Ellis, in the Flossie Johnson car. He is being challenged by car number 24, Mickey Gibbs, in one of our in-car cameras. What a story on that Johnson number 97. In 1991, Junior Johnson, along with crew chief Tim Brewer and substitute driver Tommy Ellis, were suspended, and the number 11 Budweiser car was banned from the track. Why? For using an oversized engine in the all-star race. Now, controversy between Junior Johnson and NASCAR was nothing new, nor was it a surprise that Tim Brewer was involved, who was notorious for some of his innovations. What makes this strange? I don't believe they were intentionally trying to cheat, at least not this time. Let's set the stage. It's 1991. Junior Johnson is the owner of the number 11 car and the 22 car, driven by Jeff Bodine and Sterling Marlin. Crew chief on 11 is Tim Brewer, and on the 22 is Mike Bean. The nine races prior to the All-Star race had resulted in zero wins and two top fives, both by Sterling Marlin. So they weren't exactly having a stellar season. Heading into the Winston at Charlotte, Tim Brewer had built a brand new car for Jeff Bodine, super light with all the latest gimmicks. Let's pause for a moment and examine Tim Brewer. I found this quote. Tim Brewer is one of the greatest crew chiefs and a legend in NASCAR. Who said that? Tim Brewer. <laughs> okay. Probably said that. I don't know. But this is how Daryl Waltrip described him. And Brewer, you know how Brewer was. He's cocky anyway. I got a brand new Rolex, got a pocket full of hundred dollar bills, got a pair of rock ports. I'm doing good. Shag carpet on the wall. Anyway. If you listen to any interviews at length with Tim Brewer, he does not lack in confidence and seems to always be the smartest guy in whatever room he walks into. He does not hold back when talking about former drivers or owners. And then there's this other side where he uses money from his personal account to pay the team because the owner's checks were bouncing. Or when Debbie Allison had used up all but one car in 1982 and his owner Robert Yates and crew chief Larry McReynolds approached Tim Brewer to borrow a car for backup until they could replenish their fleet, he said sure. Now, you have to remember this was during the epic championship battle of 1992 between Bill Elliott, Davey Allison, Alan Kowicki. Elliott was driving the Junior Johnson number 11 car and when Yates Racing showed up to pick up a car, they asked which one could they take. Tim said pick one. He didn't give them a junker, but they took the car Elliott had won Atlanta with earlier in the season. That car stayed at the top of the 28 hauler for weeks as the emergency backup. When asked about his first championship he won with Kill Yarborough in 1978, Tim Brewer is quick to point out he was only a co-crew chief with Travis Carter, going so far as to say the key to winning that championship was bringing in Travis Carter to help him during that season. One thing for certain, Tim Brewer is straightforward, interesting, and always entertaining when telling his stories. I guess when he got 53 wins, two championships as a crew chief, you talk the talk and you walk the walk. Now, back to the 1991 All-Star Race. Tim Brewer has built a brand new car for Jeff Bodine. It's trimmed out with all the latest innovations. However, Due to a dental appointment, he will not be present for the first part of practice. So he tells his crew, do not let Jeff Bodine get on the track with his car until he arrives. For whatever reason, Bodine gets on the track and attempts to knock down the wall, which would result in an injury that prevented him from racing for several weeks. I'm in a dentist chair in Winston-Salem, and the office called me. They said, hey, Brewer said, uh, ain't no need in going to Charlotte. He said, uh, Jeff took the car out and he wrecked it. Okay. I just hung the phone up. I go back to the shop. They pull a truck in there. The right front wheel is in the firewall in the right side where the right side front seat would be set. That's how hard he hit. You don't go to Charlotte at 3 o'clock in the afternoon when it's hotter than hell outside and drive off in turn one like there ain't no tomorrow. And he run over something, cut the front tire, and it, it killed my race car. He does say that Jeff O'Dine ran over something and cut down a tire, so I'm not sure what difference it would have made if Tim Brewer was there or not, nor his speed when entering the turns. Maybe there were a few things he needed to adjust on the car before Bodine took it on track. It's just an odd statement, but illustrates how he tells these stories. It comes off like, if I'd been there, it would never happen. The brand new car is now destroyed along with its engine. Later on, they roll out a backup car with Tommy Ellis replacing the injured Jeff Bodine at the wheel and proceed to blow that engine. So now they are down two engines. Meanwhile, Sterling Marlin has put his car on the pole for the Invitational race. The engine was pulled from that car, set aside, and replaced with the race engine. 
Junior Johnson tells Tim Brewer, go get the qualifying engine from the number 22. Tim Brewer responds with, that is a JV Reigns motor, and he doesn't want anything to do with that motor nor JV Reigns. I'm not sure why or their history. Maybe someone can enlighten me in the comments. But Junior Johnson says, look, we've already lost 200000 here this weekend. Go get that motor. So Brewer reluctantly puts the JV Reigns motor into the number 11 car. They run the all-star race. Final lap is underway. And once again, the mists have settled in. A little sprinkle in the air as we get down to finish this one. The drama is the battle with the weatherman as Davey Allison pops up out of the hole in turn number two. Drag races down the back straightaway. Davey Allison headed for victory. And Ernie Urban Swift coming off the turn two almost spun out. And Bill Elliott won that battle, but Michael Walter's about to pass him as Davey Allison comes to the line. Davey Allison is going to take it home. He's going to win. Second place is going to Schrader. Third spot to Waltrip. Fourth to the number nine of Bill Elliott. And what about fifth? Well, it was a, it was almost a dead heat, but I think the number four car got it. It was just maybe by six or eight inches. Nearly too close to call, but not the case up in front. Davey Allison dominated everything this weekend at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. And he's put his name in the record book as one who has led from flag to flag, from the outset, right to the checkers. It's been all Davey Allison. Davey Allison wins. Tommy Ellis finishes 14th. Things appear fine. Earlier in the day, you got Junior Johnson running the Legends race. He was enjoying a short track shoving match with other legends of the sport, including Fred Lorenzen, Cale Yarborough, Pete Hamilton, Buck Baker, all in good fun. Junior even laid a wrinkle on NASCAR president. Look how beat up his car is. Good grief, somebody black flagged Junior Johnson. All the cars are broken down for inspection following the All-Star race. And now we run into a bit of trouble. The engine that was barred from the number 22 team had already been flagged by NASCAR as borderline oversized. JV Reigns is specifically told, do not bring this back to the track. This information is never given to Junior Johnson or Tim Brewer. So they have no idea NASCAR has already found issues with this particular engine. And here is what really angers Tim Brewer. JV let them take that engine knowing it was oversized and put it in the 11 car. JV did not say a word. So Brewer would have probably been okay if it was one of his innovations or something he did purposely. But this was not of his doing. And circumstances forced him to use this engine. And J.V. Rain stayed quiet, knowing it was probably going to fail inspection. Which it did. The engine has measured too large. NASCAR says, let's come back tomorrow after everything has cooled down and we'll measure again. Which should be an indication of how borderline this size was. If it was 50 inches over, like an engine Junior Johnson got through inspection back in the 1960s, it does not matter how long it cools down, it will never fit inside the regulation. The next day, we have the follow-up inspection. And according to Tim Brewer, Bill French Jr., Les Richter were present, but the wrong person was holding the clipboard and calculator. That person was John Darby, a young NASCAR official looking to make a name for himself. And Brewer would insinuate that if it had been someone else, maybe the penalty is not that extreme or possibly overlooked with just a slap on the wrist. The maximum allowed engine size was 358 cubic inches. The JV Reigns engine measured at 361.856, which equates to about six or seven horsepower. Is this a case of fudging the rules or an honest mistake? Junior's team likely just used the wrong crankshaft with this particular engine block. Did any driver feel the difference between 358 and 362 cubic inches? Oh, absolutely not. You never know it. Uh, nobody in their right mind would cheat with three or four cubic inches. It just wouldn't be done. It would be 20 or 30. That's the only way it would be uh, beneficial. I mean, come on. It wasn't even a points pan race. It's an all-star race. Why not allow for a little innovation on the car? Nope. We all know what happens when NASCAR is looking to send a message to the teams. And Junior Johnson was just about to get that message. John Darby makes the call. Engine is too big. And Bill France Jr. looks over at Tim Brewer and says, I will see you in four weeks. We have owner Junior Johnson suspended and fined $7,000. Crew chief Tim Brewer suspended. And driver Tommy Ellis suspended 
and fined $18,000, the exact amount he earned from his 14th place finish in the All-Star race. Not only are they suspended, they are banned from the track and cannot run the number 11 car during this time. The following day, it's reported in the news they were suspended for 12 weeks, which at the time would have equaled the longest suspension ever in NASCAR, tying DK York, who had a terrible accident in the 1978 Southern 500. After the accident, when NASCAR was inspecting the car, they found a nitrous bottle had been installed. Leaders are told to stay down out of the high groove. There's a slow car into the wall, high in the second turn. Look out! Cuckoo Marlin rams the wall. Here come the leaders. Dave Pearson and DK Ulrich slam into Grant Adcock's stall car. Other drivers slide all over the racetrack. There on the left is the car that started it all, driven by Grant Adcox. On the right, DK Ulrich sits in junk metal and it's burning. So Tim Brewer's like, what is this 12 week suspension crap? He calls Jim French Jr. and is told, well, you have to follow the appeal process. So Brewer says he and Junior Johnson attend this kangaroo court. The appeal is denied, but they have reduced the suspension from 12 weeks to four weeks for Junior Johnson and Tim Brewer, while Tommy Ellis' suspension was removed entirely. This is my theory of the behind the scenes working of NASCAR back in the day. Bill French Jr. knew it would be four weeks, but took it to the press as 12 weeks making it seem as though they were really dropping the hammer. Once the team followed the appeal process with an independent panel, it was reduced to four weeks. Transparency and showing all the teams that the appeal process works. But in truth, whatever Bill French Jr. wanted, he got. Tim Brewers also told that he and Junior Johnson needed to lay low for the next four weeks. There was a concern they would appear in the broadcast booth during the Indy 500, that would not look good for NASCAR at all. If they stay out of sight for the next four weeks, when they return, the team would still be eligible with the Winner's Circle program, something NASCAR came up with encouraging teams to run every race. Teams that win can enter the program and stay in it for several years with extra money for winning and appearances. It typically meant an extra 160000 So Brewer tells Junior, hey, go get on your tractor, go tear some stuff up for the next four weeks, and everything will be all right when we get back to the track. In the meantime, they need to get a car ready for the Coca-Cola 600. To which Junior replies, Hey boy, I don't care. You ever notice how every story with Junior Johnson begins with, Hey boy. So Brewer knows he has Tommy Ellis in reserve and he tells his crew, get the car ready. They can't run the Junior Johnson number 11 car, so they need a new owner and a number for the car. Tim Brewer buys a NASCAR owner's license for Flossie Johnson, Junior's wife, and the car is eventually given the number 97. Dick, actually, this is Flossie Johnson's car. I'm with Tommy Ellis. Tommy, Tell me a little bit about the range of emotions you've gone through in the last week. Well, Phil, it's been it's been from the as high as high you could possibly be and almost deflatable. All the air let out of my balloon at one time. It's been a real roller coaster ride up and down. And uh, I tell you, it's 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 hard to explain in words because uh, it's hard to believe nothing can make you feel as good as I felt once I found out I had this deal. And then once I found out the problems that we had and the situation I was in, it was uh, probably one of the lowest emotional feelings I've ever had. So I'm just happy to be here today and, and want to get on. I want to get on with the program, get this deal over with, and go to Dover. They run the Coca-Cola 600 and finish 16th. Four weeks pass. Tim Brewer, Junior Johnson, and the number 11 car are reinstated. But Brewer may forgive, but he never forgets. Actually, he may not forgive or forget. I don't know. Either way, he was still upset with NASCAR. During his suspension, he's built a new car with some innovation in the rear glass section. At one point, Junior comes in the shop and sees his car and says, Hey boy, you could throw a house cat under that template at the rear window of that car. How are you going to get that through inspection? And Brewer says, Don't worry, I'll handle it. Brewer takes his new tricked up car to the track. When the NASCAR official gets ready to put the templates on the car, he asks, will that car fit the template? Brewer answers emphatic, hell no. The official says, well, I ain't going to put it on there then. I know this seems far-fetched if viewed from the perspective of today's NASCAR. However, back in the day, you had some guys that just knew how to work the room and the process, and Tim Brewer was one of those guys. 
The race starts. Jeff Bodine, now back from injury, takes off like a rocket. He's leading the race and pulling away. And there you see them with a couple of Fords, first and third in a Pontiac, sandwiched in the middle, down and turns one and two, up on the 18-degree banking. In that wind we were talking about is blowing from the fourth turn down to turn one, which lets them get in there a good bit faster than they normally would. Of course, the wind is, is gusty, and uh, good play at an important role here. Marlin, the 22, comes clamoring up through the field. He's in the eighth now with car number 22. There are the first four that we saw on the screen. Of course, the leader is Jeff Bodine, then Michael Waltrip, Mark Martin, and Davey Allison. Richard Petty has climbed from 36 to 20. Tim Brewer's revenge is complete. Uh, right up into the moment where Bodine runs over some debris and tears off the oil pan. He's burned it up. From his car. Oh, what a tough break. Yeah, we're coming. They're turning down pit road right now. He's coming in there pretty hot. There's a lot of smoke. We'll see if we can figure out what's going on. It's coming out from under the hood more so than out of the pipes. It smells like an oil leak. There's a lot of smoke coming out of the car. Tim Brewer and the guys aren't in a real big hurry here, so it's looking like it's not just something that they're going to be able to jump on and fix in a hurry. I don't see any oil out behind the car. So the revenge car is fizzled out. And you're thinking, that's not much of a story. Well, it does not end there. In some sort of poetic justice, NASCAR returns to Charlotte, the track where it all began with the oversized engine. This time, Tim Brewer has brought a car with a tricked up rear end where the spoiler is so high it reaches your armpits. This creates a ton of downforce. He again gets it through inspection and the car is cleared to race. And here's the 11 car, Bodine, who crashed in practicing for the Winston back here in May, so he missed out on that competition here. And then, of course, there was the big flap of the Junior Johnson cars being a few cubic inches over. Jeff Bodine, he was the fastest they taught in pre-speed week practice this season. Moving on to a new team next year, wanting to finish it up big time with a victory here in this autumn sprint to the finish. Rockingham and off to Phoenix, Arizona, then back to Atlanta in November to conclude the 1991 campaign. Two laps to go. We've got two laps to go. And, uh, it's going to be close, I'm telling you. I don't think you could go over and talk to Brewer now and tell you either. He'd probably tell you they're not going to try to go the rest of the way, but they might pull this thing off. Looking for that 11th win, Jeff Bodine. This would be his first win, 1991, if he can stay there. It's been a real chessboard out here this afternoon. And apparently, Tim Brewer is a master player. White flag coming out and one remain. If it'll make it down the back straightaway, and the straightaway is where it's going to run out of fuel. If it'll make it down the straightaway, it's going to pick up some more in the corner. He can get there. If he can just get to the end of the back straightaway, and get that last ounce out of it. You can pack up that Sears Craftsman kit and give it to Tim Brewer, that crew chief on that car. It's some savvy move. If we can hang together here, he's going to bring him home and give Bodine his first victory of 1991. It's going to happen at the Mellow Yellow 500. The checkers are out, and the winner is Bodine. A real study of psychology and of engineering skills between a couple of great teams. And Tim Brewer played it just right with Jeff Bodine to win the Mellow Yellow 500. And there it is. Junior Johnson, Tim Brewer, and their number 11 Budweiser car have won the return to Charlotte. Sterling Marlin once said, if you ever drove a Tim Brewer race car, you were pulling something, pushing something, or moving something all the time. In closing, I have one more quote from Tim Brewer, and this is in regards to a car raced by Bill Elliott. He said, they would have given me 30 days in the electric chair if they caught what I had on that car. And that will do it for this In the Spotlight, Tim Brewer, 361.856 cubic inches.